Hello, my name is uh, Brian Heffer and I'll be the moderator for this session. Uh, up first we have Matt Pavet. Thank you. Um, so I'll be kicking off the Cisco Power Hour. Um, <laughs> I'm a master's student at Cornell um, in the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. Um, and I'm going to talk about... Can you stay closer to the mic, please? Oh. Or, or... Okay, yeah. Um, and I'll be talking about the spawning habitat use of Cisco in the Great Lakes. Okay, uh, so I'll give a little background on Cisco first, um, kind of to start the session off. Um, they're a native fish to the Great Lakes Basin. Um, they're, uh, they occupy the offshore cold water habitat that's abundant in the Great Lakes. And they're one species in the genus Gorgonus, um, which includes uh, other Caribbean names like floater and lake whitefish, um, also present in the lakes. Uh, they form spawning aggregations uh, in the fall, typically near shore in embayments. And uh, in late November, early December, uh, they spawn um, their broadcast spawners and their eggs settle to the substrate where they overwinter until hatching in the spring. Um, another important piece of their history in the Great Lakes is uh, their historical abundance and then a uh, significant population decline across all of the lakes in uh, the mid-1900s. So uh, this is a graph of uh, fishery uh, catches um, whoops, through the 1900s. Um, you can see there was a boom in uh, the Cisco fisheries across all the lakes, and then around mid-century, uh, most of the populations uh, experienced significant declines, uh, probably as a combination of overfishing and introduced species and uh, habitat um, degradation. Um, they're currently extirpated from Lake Erie, and uh, there's remnant populations around the lakes. Um, Lake Superior, uh, there's still uh, relatively small fisheries in existence. Um, but currently, um, uh, rehabilitation of Cisco populations is uh, one management, management priority in the Great Lakes. Um, they're a native component of the food webs and uh, were uh, historically extremely abundant. Um, and so, for example, in Lake Ontario, um, the fish community objectives include uh, maintaining and um, restoring uh, a diverse prey fish community, which would include uh, native Cisco or Lake Herring. Um, so uh, in order to uh, work towards these uh, goals, there's key information needs that uh, we need to address. Um, uh, primarily uh, uh, their spatial range in the Great Lakes and habitat use um, and uh, for my project focusing on um, whether or not the availability of spawning habitat uh, could be limiting their population expansion in the lakes. So um, in order to uh, answer that question, we also need to know what makes uh, suitable spawning habitat for Cisco um, for their spawning and then for eggs to overwinter and uh, <laughs> survive through the winter. Um, and then also Cisco are known to be a relatively uh, plastic species in terms of their morphology and ecology. Um, there's several distinct uh, morphotypes that have been described around the lakes. And so um, uh, along with uh, observations and evidence that we have of uh, current spawning populations, uh, we wanna know um, the range of uh, habitat preferences across the lakes and how that differs between different populations. Um, and so for uh, the project that I've been working on, um, to address some of these questions, we uh, studied the spawning stocks in three different uh, bays in the Great Lakes. Um, Thunder Bay is up in the north uh, of Lake Superior. Um, Grand Traverse Bay is uh, um, on the northeastern side of Lake Michigan, and specifically we are studying um, a spawning location that's just offshore of uh, the town of Elk Rapids. Um, and then in uh, Lake Ontario, uh, we were looking at um, the spawning uh, population that 
um, that uh, returns to Shimoe Bay. Um, and so uh, to collect data for this, um, we uh, sampled eggs from the substrates um, in these areas in winter while they're incubating. Um, and we used a uh, gas-powered diaphragm pump, um, either through the ice or from a boat, to uh, sample eggs from the substrate. Also in Shimoe Bay, we used uh, egg mats that are um, anchored to the substrate and uh, collect eggs during spawning and egg deposition. Um, so that supplemented the um, egg pump data. Um, in addition to that, uh, at the same sites where we sampled for eggs, um, we characterized the uh, specific microhabitat conditions um, at each of those areas uh, by taking um, images of the substrate and uh, recording temperature and dissolved, dissolved oxygen. Um, and we carried out the sampling across uh, a range of depths and substrate types, um, trying to capture the uh, whole, uh, the total available habitat in each area um, so that we could look at uh, habitat uh, preference and selection. Um, and we uh, expected that substrate and, uh, and depth would be important components of um, determining whether spawning habitat uh, was suitable or not. Um, so I'll go through each uh, of our study areas. Uh, first, in Lake Michigan at the Elk Rapids site, um, it's defined by uh, kind of high energy, so lots of wave action and currents, um, very clean substrates. Uh, right near, near shore is um, kind of compacted sand with uh, some uh, long, narrow uh, cobble reefs that are just piles of cobble about this big, um, eight to 12 feet deep in some places. Uh, and then uh, heading offshore a little bit, there's more sand flats, and then um, there's a steep drop off where the substrate becomes kind of silty and there's more uh, persimmon mussels. Um, so this is uh, a map of all of the um, sites that we sampled um, in, at Elk Rapids over the uh, course of the last few winters. Um, and the sites that are um, X's, or there was no, um, there were no eggs in our samples, so we didn't find evidence of egg presence. Uh, and the green circles are where we did find some eggs. So you can see they're kind of clustered uh, near shore and then offshore. Um, and after collecting eggs, we used uh, uh, DNA barcoding to um, verify the species ID and found that uh, if we visualize kind of the whole habitat space here by depth and the uh, dominant particle size of the substrate, um, it, we found that there's evidence of cisco spawning in deeper water on soft substrates compared to eggs that were, we actually identified as whitefish found um, near those shallow reefs. Um, in Shimo Bay, uh, it's a bit different. There's um, some shallow uh, kind of rolling bedrock shoals that are covered in mussels. Um, and then in deeper areas, there's more uh, silt and soft substrate. Um, we know from a lot of work that's been done in the bay that uh, a lot of the spawning is concentrated on these shallow shoals. Um, so that's uh, a bit different from what we're, we were seeing in Michigan. Um, so our array of sites um, kind of spanned the uh, shoals and then into some of the deeper areas. And we found eggs in most places, especially uh, all of the shallow spots. Um, and they were pretty much all identified as Cisco. Uh, the gray circles are um, samples where we did find presence of eggs. Um, they're likely Cisco, but we haven't finished the um, genetic ID yet. But as you can see, most of the uh, egg presence is concentrated on these uh, shallower shoals. Um, and then in Thunder Bay in Lake Superior, um, we uh, initially already expected kind of maybe a different result as in terms of uh, the habitat used by the fish there. Um, it's mostly silty habitat. There's a lot of uh, deeper um, clay substrates. And uh, we know that commercial fishermen sometimes refer to them as mud herring. Is still, um, the spawning aggregations are sometimes uh, observed um, away from shore a little bit over this uh, mud substrate. Um, and so we sampled uh, across depths and different uh, substrate types here. Um, and uh, most of the eggs that we found were out deeper on uh, kind of the soft clay 
Um, we did find a couple of eggs shallower, one uh, identified as Cisco and another as uh, Lake Whitefish. Um, but it appears that most of the spawning, at least in this area that we studied, um, they're, uh, they prefer this uh, deeper habitat with soft substrate. Um, and so thinking about this on a broader scale in terms of Cisco and the Great Lakes in general, um, we can kind of visualize their spawning habitat uh, niche in terms of uh, like water column depth and uh, dominant substrate type. Um, you can see in Shamo Bay, the, uh, it's mostly shallow, um, but kind of spans uh, most of the substrate types where the shallowest are more rocky and then out deeper it gets more silty. And similar pattern on the other sides as far as the total um, uh, available habitat space. Um, and then on the right is kind of um, the subset of each uh, uh, total habitat space that is used by Cisco in each area. So it doesn't appear that there's, uh, as far as Cisco as a species, limitation by either substrate type or depth as far as successful spawning. Um, and looking at oxygen, um, this is also a potentially important component of what makes habitat suitable for uh, spawning and egg survival. Um, in that uh, uh, we know that low oxygen levels, especially below four milligrams per liter, um, can impair development and survival. Um, all of the sites that we studied, that, that we sampled, had uh, oxygen that was really high, at least uh, saturation. Um, so uh, thinking about what this all means in terms of uh, those management goals in Cisco rehabilitation, it doesn't seem like there's, uh, on a large scale at least, evidence of limitation by either substrate or depth. Um, they, we can kind of characterize their spawning habitat niche as being relatively broad in that they spawn shallow and deep on soft substrates and on rocky substrates. Um, and we do see habitat selectivity um, and differences in habitat preference between populations. Um, could be lo local adaptation to different ranges of available habitat, um, which fits with uh, uh, what we know about Cisco as kind of a, a plastic species that um, does exhibit a lot of local adaptation. Um, and then also uh, the question of maybe oxygen is an important uh, limiting factor in terms of where Cisco can successfully spawn. Um, there are some for instance, in Lake Ontario, some embayments that uh, were historically important spawning grounds, but we don't, uh, we haven't observed spawning there um, in a long time, and perhaps uh, those areas lack um, high enough oxygen levels. Uh, maybe it's not the substrate or uh, water depth that could be limiting uh, where they're spawning. Um, so, moving on, uh, we uh, continue to. Um, expand our search for like where Cisco are actually spawning. Um, it seems that there might be either uh, kind of expansion into other areas um, or uh, places perhaps offshore. We know that Cisco sometimes can um, spawn in deep waters. So further char uh, characterizing their um, habitat use across the Great Lakes uh, will help inform these uh, management goals. Um, and thanks to everyone who helped with all the uh, field work. Um, and across all the lakes and all these agencies, it was a huge collaborative effort. And uh, probably have time for a question. Well, I have a question. So would you say, I mean, it seemed like some places they were spawning on shallow shoals, some places not. Do you say, is it true that there was always shallow shoals available that you were choosing to spawn in each one of this area, or was there not just what was available? Uh, yeah, there is kind of overlap in each area in terms of um, there being some uh, shallow, rocky habitat available that they could spawn on. Um, the, those habitats are a little bit different between the areas. For instance, between the um, the cobble reefs at the site in Michigan are a bit different from the um, the bedrock shoals that we see in Chimo. Um 
but as far as uh, like interstitial space and kind of the complexity of um, a habitat, uh, they do seem to be uh, selecting for a softer substrate versus that more complex rocky habitat in some areas. So do you have any ideas why they would choose in Lake Superior, why they like Deep Mud and, and Shimmelvania Shallow Shore? Is that weight action or ice cover or what? Uh, yeah, it, it, that could be part of it. Um, I mean, that's uh, especially um, like wave action and uh, ice scour, for instance, can vary pretty wildly year to year. Um, but also the fact that uh, historically um, they were pretty much observed spawning everywhere, essentially. I mean, there were so many Cisco around that um, uh, what we see now could be just uh, um, kind of what's left after some spawning populations uh, have gone away. So um, we could see uh, kind of evidence of this like local adaptation. So um, I don't know, it could be a competition with other species for habitat use or uh, just kind of a legacy of um, what each population was adapted to. Yeah. From, the, from the evidence you presented, uh, it appears the species has within it tremendous uh, range of places it will deposit eggs. Is there any evidence out there for uh, whether they hatch or survive, relative hatching and surviving in those places? Uh, Yes, and you'll hear about that next. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, a little bit tougher to, um, to uh, follow the larvae and kind of survival after the uh, egg stage. Um, uh, more at a broad scale, um, there's, there's a lot of recent effort that's gone into um, looking at that. Yeah, so these were collected in, mostly in March or April, so towards the end of the incubation time. Yeah, and most of them were live and not. Yeah. How does uh, the ice formation fit with spawning time? Does it stay open longer in Thunder Bay, for example, after spawning, so they have to go deeper to protect themselves with wave action? Um, yeah, that could be part of it, um, especially, I mean, um, both in the Michigan site and at, uh, in Thunder Bay, um, ice could play a role in it. In Thunder Bay, uh, the ice formation is a little bit more um, predictable, I guess, whereas in Michigan, at that site, it's uh, a higher energy site, so the ice forms and then breaks up and forms and breaks up. Um, I think both of those processes could play into uh, where eggs might be more protected, something like that. You have a minute if you want. Okay.
Matt, can I ask you another question then, since we have time? Where are all the white fish? <laughs> uh, in shallow uh, near shore. Is that what they usually spawn? Shallow? Yeah, I think so. Um, so they're closer to lake trout, I think, or the habitat they typically use. Okay. Well, hi everyone. I'm Taylor. I'm a graduate student at Cornell. Um, a lot of my work is going to be on Kragenian ecology in Lake Ontario, building off of what Matt Povey and Ellen George have been working on uh, for the past few or several years, depending on who you're talking about. Um, and today I'll be talking a little bit about one of the projects that we've been working on and sharing some preliminary, preliminary results from that. Um, so first off, for those of you who are filing in, or for those of you who came, sat in for Matt's talk but totally forgot what he was talking about, um, Corregonines are a group of native, cold adapted fishes um, that historically were um, dominating the native food webs in the Great Lakes. Um, so for example, they were the major sources of crayfish for all of the sport fish we love, like lake trout and Atlantic salmon. Um, and economically, they also comprise the major fisheries in the region, um, not only as their own products, but as also for supporting those piscivorous uh, fisheries as well. However, um, as Matt said, this was in the past, uh, it's the past tense, but because of their collapses in the uh, early to mid 1900s, due to things like overfishing, habitat degradation, and the impacts of invasive species, we lost a lot of these populations um, and even species. But because of that known ecological and societal importance from way back when, there's a lot of management of um, rehabilitation actions all across the Great Lakes, um, including here in Lake Ontario. Um, the fish community objectives are trying to uh, go back towards, or not go back towards, um, kind of rehabilitate some of those native fishes to have a uh, diverse prey base for our fishes here in Lake Ontario. Um, but to meet those management actions, we need to figure out what we have remaining and what we can do to help that. So through these impacts, certain populations and species managed to persist. What enabled them to do that and what do we have remaining? Um, so some of the key information needs, well, before I go further, the two species that I'll be talking about are Cisco and Lake Whitefish in Lake Ontario. So as Matt was talking about, some of the key information needs include um, figuring out why certain subpopulations persisted through all of those impacts, um, and figuring out what is limiting these populations today, so we can better understand what we can do as managers and scientists to help um, rehabilitate these populations. So as part of that, um, we were looking at larval corregonine production in Lake Ontario. These are kind of my uh, jargony objectives for those of you who are more involved in this project. But uh, just in terms of short titles, we were looking at the patterns of larval corregonine production in Lake Ontario, what drives those patterns um, in terms of where we find no larvae versus few versus many, and also using that to under better understand um, Corregonine Early Life History and Ecology in Lake Ontario. So as part of that, um, there was a super collaborative, um, spatially extensive survey for larval corregonines in nearshore habitats this past year as part of the 2018 Cooperative Science and Monitoring mm -hmm. Initiative. Um, thanks to my amazing collaborators at USGS, DEC, MNRF, BFO, and Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we were able to sample a variety of both contemporary and historic spawning habitats across a wide variety of habitat gradients um, in almost all of the near shore habitats. Um, in terms of details for those methods, um, it was repeated sampling during peak larval Craigenian abundance um, within each habitat, um, repeated sampling with horizontal ichthyoplankton toes. And then we also have water samples for total phosphorus. Um, those aren't um, processed yet, so uh, more to come on that. 
And then in lab, we sorted those samples, counted and identified the larvae, subsampled for zooplankton. And then one thing that is important to note is that um, we still are in the process of identifying these pregonines to the species level using genetic barcoding. Um, one of the problems with larval pregonines is that it's almost, uh, it's pretty inaccurate to try and distinguish between cisco and lake whitefish as their larvae because they are really plastic in their morphology. So for example, Ellen George developed a genetic barcoding technique using the CO1 gene that we're using with the help of um, USGS Lake Ontario Biological Station and Nick Sard at SUNY Oswego. So that's still to come. Um, so everything that I present today is going to be the, to the Kragenine level or to the, uh, could be either Cisco or Lake Whitefish, but we're gonna find out soon. So just to lay this out, this is just a map of Lake Ontario. Um, with the generalized regions that we know established populations are today. So the two major ones are in the Bay of Quinte in Ontario and Shimo Bay, New York. So those are kind of like our baseline, what we know is going on in the lake in terms of where spawning is occurring. And so add on top of that, all of the 1,100 ichthyoplankton samples that were taken this past year, which again is amazing and could not have been done without all of the countless field crews that went out collecting larvae. Um, so we sampled a variety of habitats all across the, you know, the North Shore, Bay of Quinte, um, the Shimo Bay region, the southern embayments like around Decoy Bay, Sodus Bay, over by the Niagara River, and over in Hamilton Harbor as well. So for some results, um, kind of hard to see. Um, so the colors change to red if we found Kragenine larvae there. I'll walk you through a little bit better for those of you that's harder to see. And then it's purple for where they're not yet processed. Again, it's hard to see, so I'll walk you through it. Um, so for the habitats that aren't yet processed, they're the Hamilton Harbor ones, and then these samples over here in the St. Lawrence River. <laughs> and then for the habitats where we found larvae, um, we found a lot of Samples here over in the Bay of Quinte had larvae, um, in the Shimo Bay, Fox and Grenadier, um, Henderson, um, some in Oswego, like the southern embayments, um, all of the southern, southern embayments, um, some over in the Niagara even. Um, should be a little bit easier to see on the next slide. Um, so just for example, we found larvae in many different habitats, not just the ones where we, um, our baseline knowledge was uh, in the Shimo Bay and the Bay of Quinte areas. So there's a lot more to learn about these populations. And then if we look at uh, relative abundance, this is just standardized relative abundance across the lake um, to account for variances in sampling effort. So basically the larger the circles, the more larvae that were captured. So we see that um, all across the lake we're seeing um, some ranges in where we find no larvae versus few larvae versus many larvae. So you can see the largest circles are like in the Bay of Quinte and Chimo, which is expected knowing that those are where our established populations are. Um, and then we also found um, another kind of hot spot of larvae over here in the Brighton region on the North Shore, which is spatially separated from the other two hot spots. Um, but other things that we can see is that along with hot spots, we observe apparent cold spots. So we have hot spots where, for example, in Brighton, we capture over 75 larvae in 20 samples. But in these other habitats where production is occurring, in the same amount of effort, we only catch a few larvae. So thinking about, and then there's also Shimo Bay, which is kind of like the mother of all hot spots, where we find 1,100 larvae in uh, only 40 samples. What drives those patterns between where spawning is occurring, but where we find few larvae, and what makes a hot spot in terms of what is it about those habitats that, um, or those spawning populations that are producing so many larvae? And um, yeah, so going into that a little bit further. <clears throat> so this one is kind of moving from patterns <coughs> to processes, moving from what we observe and trying to link that to biotic and abiotic drivers. Um, so for this, I'm gonna um, 
just be talking about what's coming up next um, and thinking about where we're moving towards with this project and talking about some of the potential hypotheses that might explain these. So like I was saying earlier, what makes a hot spot? Is there something particularly um, exceptional about these habitats that allow for such high production of larvae? Um, is it simply an artifact of where these remnant populations are located? For example, in the Bay of Quinte and Shimo Bay, is this simply, uh, we, do we simply see so many larvae just because that's where the highest numbers of fish are? Or is it something to do with these habitats have the ideal set of habitat characteristics for production of these larvae? Do these habitats that are these hotspots represent the most ideal um, set of habitat characteristics for spawning and survival for early life history stages. So for example, um, as Matt was talking about earlier, perhaps the physical habitat is especially suited for development here. And then in contrast, a cold spot or a place where we see larval production occurring, there are adults spawning there, but for whatever reason, we're only seeing very few larvae in our sampling, assuming that's representative of the, the general density larvae there. Is it uh, simply a result of this is there's just a couple or small numbers of adults spawning there in terms of perhaps this is just natural um, straying rates in these populations. Perhaps we're only seeing low densities because there's not many adults there. They're not going to produce many um, larvae to begin with irregardless of the habitat there and saying that this is the beginning of a population expansion. Perhaps we'll see growth to come. Or is this a population that has higher numbers of adults, but they're facing some sort of constraint? They're spawning, but for whatever reason, we're not observing larvae because they're not, um, because they're facing some sort of biotic or abiotic limitation that's limiting survival. Um, for example, if all of the larvae um, don't survive because of starvation, um, competition, predation, or just being laid on um, inappropriate spawning habitat for development, those fishes aren't going to recruit to the population and be able to come back and complete their life cycle and sustain those populations to come. So we might be seeing some sort of bottleneck due to habitat here. And so looking at both abiotic and biotic drivers, we might be able to flush apart some of those pieces. And so putting that all together and taking that back to the management context and the research context, if we can elucidate these factors that are driving these patterns, we might be able to better understand the role of habitat for these fishes and how that might uh, help us in terms of figuring out what the potential for these populations are for expansion and for rehabilitation. So that's kind of where we're at right now. There's still a lot more work to be done. Um, so for example, there's still more sample processing to be done, um, including the genetics to parse that out into species. Um, and then looking quantitatively at the biotic and abiotic drivers of the um, observed differences in relative abundance and presence absence for these fishes. And then pulling that all back together, applying that and putting the puzzle pieces together for understanding early life history habitat and ecology across habitats in Lake Ontario. And I'd like to thank all of my collaborators who helped, like I said, the countless field crews to collect so many samples. Um, give a shout out to Amanda Cooper, Alyssa Lau, and Darren Reinhardt. They're not here today, but they're the amazing techs on this project and I could not have done it without them. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Yes. Are you planning to look at the differences in some of those states for things like wind forcing, you know, upwelling, local currents <coughs> that might play a role in egg survival and larval survival? Yeah, definitely. That's something um, that we can look at both in terms of egg survival and larval survival, um, especially in terms of if the currents are too high and they knock the, the eggs or larvae outside of suitable um, physical habitat, definitely. Yeah. Any uh, uh, conjecture or thoughts on what your limiting factors might be or, or whether mm -hmm. it's yeah. yeah, well, 
Well, one thing that we've seen with um, a lot of the work that has come before me is that these fish are incredibly plastic. Um, they have all sorts of, um, it seems that they can spawn in a lot of different habitats, like per Matt's presentation, it doesn't seem, at least um, across lakes, that physical habitat, like substrate and depth as the factors that we've looked at there may be limiting. Um, there may be other physical habitats as well, but um, yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see, look into other factors of physical habitat and then trophic factors as well. Um, there's a lot of mouths to feed out in Lake Ontario, a lot of planktivores, so it could be very likely that um, all of those larvae are nice snacks for some of those um, fish out there. Yeah, Hannah. I think you probably said in your uh, methods, but generally like north versus south shore, was there a time difference in sampling or? Generally not. We had a bunch of field crews out there at the same time. Nice. Um, so a lot of coordination, thanks to Brian Weidel for that, um, in terms of getting lots of these different habitats um, without any sort of time differences so we can see what's going on at the same time. Awesome. Yeah. You, you didn't say much about the Bay of Quinty itself, which mm -hmm. is probably a very unique area somewhere like Chabot Bay. It's mm -hmm. so isolated and protected. That, yeah. uh, have you looked or started to look at that one particularly to see uh, the, the, the quantitative estimates on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've looked a little bit into, um, preliminarily, into some of the physical habitat data. I don't show any of it here because it's a little bit mm -hmm. um, preliminary. But if we're thinking about things like substrate and depth, like Matt has talked about before, um, which is what I've looked into so far, building off of what he's done, the substrate and the depth gradients are very different in Shimo versus Bay of Quinty. So um, Bay of Quinty has a lot of mud and clay versus Chameau, which has like that shoal habitat. So if we're thinking of those being our two established populations, as long as they're not somewhat how locally adapted, it doesn't seem like substrate might be limiting there yeah. because they're succeeding that in both of those approach. habitats. Yeah. yeah. Okay, unless anyone has any other questions, hello Lars. <laughs> <laughs> So did you, uh, you said you had the same timing of the samples in both South Shore and North Shore and Bay of Quinty? Yes. Uh, but it lasted for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, were the larvae the, about the same size in the two areas? Yeah, so we're still working on measuring the larvae. Um, so that's one thing I want to look at both in terms of um, like hatch dates or how uh, well these larvae are growing in terms of um, are some habitats better for others in terms of larval growth rates? Um, but going through 1,100 samples and picking all of those ichthyoplankton <laughs> samples, it's kind of just you got to run through them and then you go back in and measure the larvae later. So that's to come, um, but I am very interested in that, definitely. something there.
to look at all of these different genetic um, measures that I'm going to share with you, we used eight different microsatellite markers uh, that amplify in both Lake Whitefish and Cisco um, and have been used in these species across the Great Lakes uh, pretty extensively by Wendy Stott at USGS uh, in Ann Arbor. So uh, these are markers that, uh, while they amplify in both species, some of the markers show pretty different uh, allele uh, frequencies between the two species as well. So some are a little bit more similar, some are different, but they amplify it in, all, in, in both species, so we can use all eight markers. So first I wanna share with you uh, some structure plots uh, that show the different stock structures in Lake Ontario. Um, this is, uh, these plots are created by uh, putting our microsatellite data through a program called Structure, which is a Bayesian uh, clustering method that assigns each individual fish to uh, a certain population. So um, this is all of our data, including both all, all, all the Cisco populations and the lake whitefish as well. Uh, in this case, um, Structure said that it's most likely that we have two populations, both uh, the different species. So. <laughs> They're different species. <laughs> um, but this is, a, I like this graph because it really shows you, um, uh, one, that we are dealing with different species, um, but uh, also some kind of cool things to do with hybrids. So uh, in this plot, um, each individual is represented as a vertical bar, and uh, each, what we're calling population, so um, sampling location and year, is split up into different blocks. Um, all the green are Cisco uh, on, the, on the left, oh, way over on the right are Lake Whitefish in red. Um, but in the middle, you can see a few uh, vertical bars um, that are half and half. So half green, half red. And these represent potential Lake Whitefish Cisco hybrids that were caught during sampling. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about those later. Um, but anyway, um, while we're looking at these two different species, uh, I also wanted to share the FST value with you. So this is a measure of genetic distance between the two species, how different are these uh, species genetically. Um, and our FST value for two, between two different species is 0.21. So I want you to remember that number just for one more slide. Don't worry, not too much longer. Um, okay, but of course we're interested in stock structure between just the Cisco. Uh, so I have, in this plot, I've taken Lake Whitefish out and we're just looking at the different Cisco populations um, in Lake Ontario. Uh, so in this case, uh, running um, this data through the structure program showed that a single population is, uh, has the highest likelihood. So we actually don't see any evidence with these markers of any uh, stock structure in Lake Ontario. Um, the, the K equals one or the one population <laughs> graph is very boring because it's just a solid block of color. So I've shown this, the K equals two plot here because it's more interesting to look at. Um, but, and also just to show that there really is not a lot of difference between the different populations here. Um, they all have pretty similar uh, allele frequencies between the two. Uh, the one population that does look a little different is that Wellington um, <coughs> sample, which is the historical uh, 1980 samples from Ontario. Um, however, those uh, were also scale sample samples that were pretty old. so. Um, it had a pretty high genotyping error, so we think that that's just a, a relic of the fact that we had a lot of allelic dropout and issues reading um, genotypes with that, um, with that uh, population. Uh, but even with those differences, they still, it still was not sig significantly different than the other populations in Lake Ontario. So uh, at least genetically, no sign of any stock structure in the Lake Ontario populations. The two spawning populations are pretty similar genetically. Um, and uh, just to drive that point home, um, if you remember the FST value between two species is 0.21. Um, the F average FST value between all these Cisco populations is very small, just 0.03. So not a lot of genetic differentiation between these, uh, these uh, subpopulations. Um, okay, so if we, um, we now know that there's not very strong, uh, or there's no evidence of uh, stock structure, genetic stock structure in Lake Ontario, uh, let's dive a little bit into the diversity measures and look at how diverse each of these subpopulations are. Um, so if we combine all those Cisco populations and look at their genetic diversity, um, we found that we had really high allelic richness, which are, is the number of alleles per the eight different, lo different loci that we looked at. Um, pretty high uh, number of alleles across each population. Also, uh, putting our data through program bottleneck showed that we didn't have any um, significant excesses of heterozygosity in any of these populations. 
And what that tells us is that we're not seeing um, any evidence for a strong genetic bottleneck for uh, any of the, uh, the, for the Cisco population in Lake Ontario. So even though they went through this really big population decline about 100 years ago, it doesn't seem to have really strongly affected their genetic diversity. So they've, made, they've managed to maintain pretty high genetic diversity despite this big population decline. Um, also, if we look at the individual populations, um, they have very low uh, FIS, which is also called the inbreeding statistic. Uh, it's a measure of genetic diversity within each subpopulation. Um, they have very low inbreeding statistics for all the different populations we looked at. Um, also very high expected heterozygosity across all the different populations. So what that tells us is not only are these Cisco and Lake Ontario uh, pretty genetically diverse, um, all the different populations are, have a similar level of diversity. So it's not just one population, for example, that for some reason ex is experiencing really high inbreeding um, or low genetic diversity. It seems to be high diversity across the board. Uh, we also looked at the effective population size, um, which is abbreviated NE, and a pop effective population size is the size of a quote unquote ideal mo model population that would be experiencing uh, the same rate of genetic drift or loss of genetic uh, variation as the population of interest that we're looking at. So um, in fish populations um, and marine populations, they can, uh, they often have census sizes uh, in you know hundreds of thousands, millions, whatever, but the effective population size uh, can be much, much lower. Um, and a low NE is bad news, so you do not want a low effective population size. If you have a low effective population size, it means that your population is ex exhibiting um, genetic drift or random genetic changes um, at a much higher uh, rate than you would expect given the census size of the population. Um, and what that means is that there's this population is at risk for a higher rate of, ge of loss of genetic variation than you would expect given that you have um, a, what looks like a big population of fish. Um, so we combined all of the uh, Cisco populations um, for Lake Ontario except for those historical Wellington samples because we wanted to get an idea of the current effective population size. Uh, and we found actually a pretty high effective population size. So uh, any of about 5,000 with an upper bound of infinity. Infinity Cisco. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yes, my dream. Um, <laughs> so that's really good news. Um, that means that it doesn't look like this population is at risk for losing a lot of genetic diversity based on random uh, changes in allele frequency. Okay, so I mentioned those hybrids in that structure plot, those little bars that were half red and half green. Um, we were concerned about uh, the rate of hybridization between Cisco and whitefish um, for several different reasons. First of all, um, Lake Whitefish and Cisco, at least in Shamo Bay, are often spawning on the same substrate, but they are temporarily segregated by about two weeks. So often the white Lake Whitefish will come in and spawn and leave, and then about two weeks later the Cisco come in and spawn and leave. That's in a normal year. Um, in a few of the last, in a, a couple of the last few years though, we've had some weird falls where it's been pretty warm late into fall, and then all of a sudden it's cooled down very quickly near the end of fall. Um, and when that has happened, uh, it seems like the whitefish and cisco are coming in at the same time and spawning. So we'll catch a ripe cisco and ripe whitefish in the trap nets on the shoals at the same time. Um, and they can uh, hybridize, at least in the lab, and sometimes in the wild they've been observed hybridizing as well. So um, we were concerned about that. Uh, we also, uh, Taylor mentioned earlier that we have some weird larvae in Lake Ontario. The majority of our larvae uh, cannot be keyed out to Lake Whitefish or Cisco. Instead, they show these intermediate overlapping characteristics. So we were concerned that that meant that there was such a high level of hybridization that we were getting all these hybrid larvae. Um, and also, we do know that fishermen uh, have reported um, Cisco, what they call Cisco mules in the Bay of Quinte, which are adults that display intermediate characteristics between Lake Whitefish and Cisco. Um, and so we uh, were concerned about how, um, if there was a hybrid of hybridization, how is that gonna affect Cisco restoration in the future? Um, and so in order to identify wild hybrids, we developed a uh, new uh, panel of three different markers, uh, genetic markers that can identify a wild hybrid. Um, two of the markers are fixed in the two different species. So Cisco will always show one banding pattern and Lake Whitefish will always show the other. Um, one of our markers is not completely fixed, but it shows a very different allele frequency between the two species. 
Um, so, uh, for example, uh, just to show an example of how this works, um, up here is an image of a gel. On the left, uh, in yellow, uh, there are three lake whitefish individuals, and they have a smaller, um, a smaller band size, and so it travels farther down on the gel. Uh, on the right, we have uh, four Cisco species in red, um, and they have a larger band size, so it doesn't travel as far on the gel. Um, the ones that the fish in the middle, who are uh, in blue, are all hybrids. So they display both the lake whitefish band and the Cisco band. So it's a pretty clear way to see if you have a hybrid or not. Uh, so using these three, these three marker panel, we uh, were able to identify 11 adult hybrids that were collected in the Bay of Quinte. Um, and uh, these were fish that were collected during the commercial uh, fishing season and were identified upon collection as having intermediate characteristics between Cisco and whitefish. One thing that was really cool and really interesting about them though is that three of these fish who were hybrids showed banding patterns that suggested that they might be F2 back crosses, which means that um, one of their parents was a hybrid and one of their parents was either a full-blooded full Cisco or whitefish, which means that uh, if these are F2 back crosses, that a hybrid successfully came back and spawned and back crossed with uh, either a Cisco or a whitefish. Um, which is uh, not what we were expecting because a lot of times the commercial fishermen will report that they have these mules, but they, uh, they won't be ripe, they won't have developed eggs, or they appear to not have developed eggs um, in the past. Um, however, if, uh, with these F2 back crosses, it shows that at least some hybrids do, uh, are able to come back and are ripe and are able to spawn and create uh, viable offspring. And this was, uh, this was, um, uh, further supported by the fact that in Shimo Bay in 2017, we collected an adult female um, who was ripe with eggs and she was identi genetically identified as uh, being a, a hybrid. So it seems that while uh, at least some of these hybrids, um, although hybrids do su survive to adulthood, at least some of them are ripe and may be able to back cross and spawn with uh, Cisco and whitefish. Um, what this doesn't tell us though is the rate of hybridization. So these are confirmations of adults, but we uh, don't get a rate from this. So to look at what the rate of hybridization might be. We um, ran these three marker, pa marker panel um, on over 700 larvae that were collected from Chameau Bay in 2014. Um, and we did find uh, larval hybrids, but the rate was very low. 0.1% uh, of the larvae were uh, identified as hybrids. Um, so low, but not unheard of. Um, one nice thing that this means is that the huge amount of overlap in larval morphometrics that we see is not due to the fact that oh, we have all these hybrids in Shimo Bay. We just have very weird larvae that are hard to ID. <laughs> um, so hence the genetic identification of larvae that Taylor's having to do. Um, but we do have some larvae that are, um, that are hybrids. Uh, and not only do we have uh, larval hybrids, but these hybrids do uh, survive to adulthood and may successfully breed and back cross in the future. Um, uh, one thing that's really been, we've really been thinking about lately is how climate change is going to affect this rate of hybridization. So uh, the larvae that were collected in this year, 2014, had more of what we call a normal fall, where um, it was a, a slower cool down, those whitefish came in and spawned, um, and then the cisco came in and spawned. There wasn't as much overlap in spawning time. Um, okay. <laughs> um, but uh, as climate change creates these warmer falls that stay warm later and cool down faster, um, that may change this rate of hybridization. So in conclusion, um, generally, uh, good news for Cisco and Lake Ontario. Uh, we did not find any, um, uh, ex uh, any uh, evidence of population structure, but to put that in context, it really doesn't take that many individuals straying to uh, the wrong spawning area to erode any um, signal of genetic structure uh, based on the markers that we use. So really it only takes maybe one or two individuals a generation to create enough gene flow to, uh, to get rid of any structure. Um, so that means that while we didn't find any genetic structure and that genetically these populations are similarly diverse, um, that doesn't mean necessarily mean that there's no demographic structure. So that's important. Um, but overall, Cisco and Lake Ontario are very diverse. All the different subpopulations we studied were similarly diverse, which is great news. Uh, and no um, uh, evidence for a uh, huge loss in uh, genetic diversity from a bottleneck, um, which means that uh, because they've been able to maintain this diversity, uh, even though there was a huge population decline, it means that um, hopefully that means that there will be uh,
quite a bit of adaptive capacity for this population moving into the future. Um, as far as hybridization goes, hybridization does happen. Um, not only does it happen with lake whitefish, but, uh, or, uh, and then we find it in the larvae, but these hybrids do grow to adulthood and may come back and interbreed and um, back cross with uh, cisco and whitefish, uh, which could be a concern moving forward in the future as climate change changes uh, spawning time for these species. Uh, and with that, with that, I would like to thank everybody that made this huge project uh, possible. Um, do I have any time for questions? Yeah, okay, I have a minute. <laughs> thank you. Yes? The percent of hybrids in the larval um, samples was like one. Yeah. You got one out of 738. One. Okay. There was one <laughs> larvae, yes. So what, is, what, is, what was that same value for adults that you randomly um, so the adults, we can't really uh, translate that into a rate because um, the way those adults were collected was basically over the years, anytime, um, uh, anytime um, they were sampling adults, if one looked weird, they would keep it. So it's, um, I don't have a rate for that because it's not really random not sampling. Random. Okay. Yeah, so that's why you did the larvae because we didn't have any like preconceived idea of what the larvae were. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so, but we were able to at least um, show that there was enough coming back that we had these adults, adult hybrids. Is that good? Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Last up, we have panel a chance. Okay, come on in. There's some seats up front. <laughs> Um, so, I hope everyone appreciated the terrible pun that I included in my title. I am shedding light <laughs> on an understudied environmental factor, that environmental factor being light. So, <laughs> I just had to, I couldn't help it. Um, so anyways, the question here is though, how does light impact cisco, eggs, and larvae? And this question stemmed from the bigger question of how does climate change impact cisco? And so before we dive into that question too much, for those of you who, who didn't sit in on four other, or three other talks on Cisco, I'll talk a little bit about Cisco. <laughs> so they are a native prey species to the Great Lakes that historically were once widespread and abundant, but due to overharvesting and invasive species and habitat degradation, their populations are nowhere near where they used to be. Um, however, they fulfill a lot of really important roles in the Great Lakes including an ecological role. Um, basically, at every single life stage, Cisco is consumed by some sort of or organism. And some of these organisms, or predators, also have an economic value. So like, like whitefish and lake trout and others, they are harvested for um, an ecological or an economic reason in the Great Lakes. And then Cisco themselves have become a popular source of caviar in Europe, so they also hold a direct economic role as well. So if we want to be conserving these ecological and economic roles, but in a population that is already depleted, we need to think about um, conservation and restoration, which is being done, which is great. But part of thinking about that is thinking about any negative implications that could uh, continue to drastically affect these populations. And of course, that brings us back to the big bag topic of climate change. Um, so climate change, though, is a pretty a broad topic. And so you kind of need to break it down and frame it in order to understand its context. Um, and our context is its impact on Cisco. And since we're specifically talking about the Great Lakes, we can zoom in on the Great Lakes. Sorry that the uh, lighting and coloring is a little different. Um, but we can even frame it a little bit more by thinking about climate change impacts during a certain time of year. So for Cisco, that time of year is winter. And why we are focusing on winter is because part of their life history, as a crucial part of their life history, is uh, spawning their eggs right in the early winter and having those eggs incubate and develop throughout winter, and historically winter includes ice, so that's foreshadowing to where I'm heading. But basically they also, their, their larvae tend to hatch out around ice out. So what we do know about climate change in the Great Lakes during winter is that unfortunately it means um, less ice. And so this is a cool gift from Gloral. 
showing over the past 40 or so years the variability of ice coverage in the Great Lakes. And while there is variable ice coverage, so every time you see blue, that's zero ice coverage, and every time you see white, that means at some point that winter there was 100% ice coverage. Um, but that is variable, and overall there have been a couple papers showing that the ice coverage is definitely declining in all of the Great Lakes. So we can start to think again about what that means for Cisco, but first we'll start thinking about what reduced ice coverage means in general. And that includes changes in a couple different environmental factors, such as flow and light and temperature, and some of these have been alluded to in earlier talks. Um, and while temperature has is, is been well studied, the effects of temperature on Cisco eggs specifically has been well studied and continues to be well studied. And flow is something that's up and coming, but it is getting some attention as well. That kind of leaves us with the environmental factor of light. And light impacts on fish egg development in general is pretty understudied, but in other organisms where light is studied on um, development of early life especially, it has been shown to change um, pathways in molecular processes or, uh, for example, if you've heard of circadian rhythm in birds, it, it tells your body when to turn on and off certain processes. And we also know that um, with snow and ice, you're getting very minimal light entering the water column, especially to some of these shallow depths where Cisco are spawning, such as Matt discussed in Lake Ontario, it's pretty shallow. So, um, And then the, the other extreme here is no ice, where you can get the maximum amount of ice light entering the water column. So since there's such a drastic change from almost no light to light in the time that these Cisco eggs are developing, we think that there's potential for these this light to be impacting their development. But the question is, since it's understudied, the first question is, does light impact their development? And then if it does, how does it impact their development? So that brings us back to this question of how does climate change impact Cisco? But we've kind of taken that question and framed it a little bit more specifically to be, how does light impact Cisco eggs and larvae? And so, We'll talk a little bit about my project, which is a pilot study to see the impacts of light on Cisco eggs. And so, first of all, we, with the help of uh, New York DEC and Tunison, we collected some Cisco eggs, we fertilized them, and then we drove them to the wonderful state of Vermont, where they were put in one of three treatments, a either 24-hour light treatment, a 24-hour dark treatment, or a regular photo period treatment that simulates the day-night cycle experienced by Cisco eggs in Lake Ontario, since these eggs were from Lake Ontario. And all other environmental conditions were kept the same. Temperature was the same, flow was the same. Um, each, each bin that they were reared in had uh, a light, kind of like, you can kind of see it in that picture on the far right, um, that controlled the amount of light that the Cisco eggs were getting. So everything was very controlled. And to understand some of these development and survival metrics, we had, a, with the help of graduate student Taylor Stewart, we measured a weekly throughout egg development, different developmental assessments. Um, yolk sac measurements were taken, and then at the end of the period, uh, overall mortality was assessed as well. And then once the eggs hatched in the larvae, they were moved out of those light treatments and into a consistent photo period treatment, since that mimics the ice melt off and back into a regular cycle. Um, and seeing if there was any long-term effects on the larvae due to these light treatments, light or no light treatments. And so after the larvae hatched, uh, length measurements were taken. There was also yolk sac measurements taken at hatch. And then mortality throughout the larval phase was also um, assessed. And so while these metrics can give us a idea of how, how you know, broadly development might be affected or survival might be affected, we wanted to get a better or more thorough picture of what's going on here. So we decided to pair these techniques with uh, molecular techniques, and that's where I came in. So the molecular technique we decided to use is called a transcriptome. And using a transcriptome basically means that while you have a lot of genes present, 
you're only using a couple of them at once. And so by collecting the RNA present, because you take your DNA, um, RNA copies that and turns it into a protein. So basically, by capturing just the RNA present, we're able to get at which genes are being expressed and then at what level they're being expressed since we're capturing all of the RNA present at a time. So here you've only got you know three out of the seven genes being expressed and we can identify which genes those are. And then we can also identify at what level they're being expressed because maybe in the dark treatment, they're showing one of these genes but at a low level of expression, but then when you put it in the light treatment or you compare it to the light treatment, they're expressing that gene at a way higher level. So this is a pretty um, thorough technique that hopefully, well, it did give us a lot of great data. Um, so, but before we get into that, we'll talk a little bit about some of the observation results. Um, and those basically are that light decreases the incubation period. And so the eggs reared in the light treatment hatched a full seven to eight days before the regular photo period treatment and the no light treatment. And so this right here, the x-axis is days post fertilization and the y-axis is proportion of hatched larvae. So we used when each tank reached 50% hatch as the metric for um, calculating this difference. Another observation that we saw was that the yolk sacs in the larvae at hatch in the light treatment were smaller compared to the other two treatments. And something else that's interesting to note here is that the yolk sacs in the no light treatment were the largest compared to the other treatments. So basically, the Cisco eggs have their yolk sacs to feed on throughout egg development, but they also need some of that yolk sac left over to continue to feed on for the first two or so weeks after hatch, and that just helps them switch to exogenous feeding. And then finally, we saw higher larval mortality in the light treatment. So while egg mortality was similar for all three treatments, we definitely saw a pretty high mortality for the larvae in the light treatment. And so with just these results alone, you can maybe start to paint a picture of perhaps the small yolk sac size and the um, large amount of mortality in the, in the larvae could be linked. But we can also kind of get at that idea a little bit more by bringing in the transcriptome results. And so broadly, a, a transcriptome gives you a lot of great data, but you start with millions of reads. And reads are basically 150 base pair, base pair being like the A, the T, the Cs. So it's 150 segment of genes. And so first you gotta take those millions of reads, compile them back into transcripts, which can be kind of gene equivalents. And then you can start to get an idea of how these genes are being used. So with these millions of reads, we ended up with about 82,000 transcripts. And this is a PCA that shows some general, um, you can get an idea of how the genes might be expressed differently in treatment and life stage. So life stage is the shape of the icon and then the color, so the orangish color is the light treatment and the teal color is the dark treatment. And while you see some separation, there's not clear separation here. So we can take it one step further and start thinking about how these um, eight, you know, 80,000 or so transcripts are used. So thanks to many scientists before me, there are some wonderful databases out there where not only have they identified what these genes are, they've also gone to, um, they've done lots of studies to figure out what the function of those genes are. And so by putting our results into these databases, we can get an idea of what these and genes are and how they differentially express. And so first of all, we saw that there was some differential expression. So that just means that one gene was expressed in one treatment differently than it was expressed in the other treatment. And so this is just the number of differentially expressed genes and whether they were up or down regulated in response to light. Um, so we did see a lot more differential expression in the larvae compared to the eggs but once you filter it through these resources that give you the function of these genes, you actually only get a handful because while the resources are great, um, the function of a gene in a fish might not be the same as a human, so we have to use only functions that have been annotated in similar species. But we still did see a little bit of functional enrichment 
And that just means that certain functions popped up more often, um, meaning that they're like not only one gene, but maybe multiple genes with that similar function were being used in the light treatment compared to the dark. So these results are for the eggs. And basically anything with a yellow box shows that there was a significant level of functional enrichment. And it's hard to read, and honestly, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you don't know the specific, like, all the specific pathways. But what's important here is that all of these link to metabolic processes. Um, and so if we take an example of one of these genes, and we'll use the BVRA, which is Billy Bearden reductase A. And I chose that gene because it was upregulated in eggs and larvae in the light treatment. So this means that this gene was at a much higher level of expression expression compared to the dark treatment for both the eggs and larvae. And so it means they were using that gene more. So why are they using this gene more? What is that gene? And this is where we can start to look at the functional data that's available. And one of the functions of this gene is heme catabolism, which means as you break down your red blood cells, you're actually also gonna break down the different parts of the red blood cells, including, including hemoglobin. So here is the gene right here, and it just helps break down the parts of blood. So it's part of a blood breakdown chain. But it also has, so sometimes genes have more than one function, and BVRA also has a function in the insulin signaling pathway. And so it helps increase the uptake of insulin, which also means that it helps increase the uptake of glucose and fatty acids. And I think this is important because this starts to make sense in the context of our other results. And so if we start to, again, these are just both metabolic pathways, um, meaning metabolic is kind of a, you know, a broad term that just talks about burning energy in a lot of different ways and breaking things down. And so if we kind of take our transcriptome results and then we go back to those initial results, we can start to draw a couple conclusions. And the first one being that pairing these techniques has been really handy because it just kind of gives us a way better understanding of what's going on. So here we can take the increased expression in various metabolic pathways. And now we understand that there, the eggs and larvae raised in the light are breaking down more, um, just even the process of breaking down cause, like need, causes you to need to burn energy. And so the fact that they're burning energy and some of these are specifically related to uptake of you know, fatty acids, which is what their yolk sac is made out of, um, this kind of starts to give us an idea of why they're having smaller yolk sacs. And then that also could perhaps explain why we saw an increased mortality as well. So pairing these understandings has been really helpful to kind of confirm our initial theories. Um, to an extent. Another way is that we can use some of these genes to, um, we could use them as markers. So while we reared these eggs in experimental treatments, if you, for example, use Matt and Ellen's egg pumping device and you sample some eggs from under the ice, and you know that there was ice there when you're sampling, obviously, but perhaps I light, um, ice took a while to come on and then it melted off pretty early, you want to understand if the eggs or the larvae that you sample have any, any negative impacts of light. You can possibly use the BVRA gene and see what level of expression or if it's differentially expressed in perhaps in um, a bay that had 100% ice coverage versus a bay that had more sporadic ice coverage, for example. Another thing is that this, this pilot study has shown that focusing on not only temperature but other environmental factors such as light is important because temperature definitely is a, a direct, it's something that people automatically think about when they think of climate change, but there's a lot of other effects of climate change and light is definitely one that wor is worth further investigation. And then finally, we were able to kind of filter climate change down into this more specific idea of light and but because we did so in a way that framed our understanding of how Cisco were impacted by climate change you can take our understanding of how Cisco are impacted by light and start to think more broadly about how they're impacted by climate change especially if you pair our results with other results um, or you design a full factorial study incorporating multiple environmental factors so uh, with that 
I would like to acknowledge all our funding sources and all the help I've had from the two labs that I did my genetics and um, my master's in, as well as Tunison and New York DEC, et cetera, for all the help getting the Cisco eggs, help with the bioinformatics, because transcriptomics takes a lot of computer processing time, and then our undergrad, Maddie, who helped rear and uh, maintain the egg populations and larval populations. And with that, I will take any questions if we have time. It looks like the differences that you saw were that, I mean, the 24 hour light period and others. Definitely. And climate change isn't going to make 24 hours of light. So, yeah. um, I guess how does this translate to, to what you might see in the study? So, this was a pilot study, and we chose those extreme treatments just to see if there was any kind of impact of light. And then a next experiment, we uh, plan to incorporate. We plan to incorporate the. Uh, so we set some light sensors in both Lake Champlain and Lake Superior to get an idea of the light intensity differences under snow and ice and ice, etc. And then incorporating those into a full factorial design would kind of be the next step. There is some documentation in like as far as you know, aquaculture. Mm -hmm. or Definitely. And um, a question we often get is like what kind of light we use because people think that also has an impact. And basically we use, um, it's like an agri-light system that they use in agriculture to mimic natural light. So that's been nice to be able to draw that towards the natural idea of what kind of light they'd be experiencing. Anyone else? <laughs> 